tonight's speaker. Uh, turn off your phones. And uh, then I just want to say a few words about the library. We're one of the oldest libraries in the country and the oldest in the city. It was founded in 1754 by a group of civic-minded people intent on creating a public library that would be very useful as well as ornamental to the city. The intervening 263 years have made the library one of New York City's enduring institutions. Please support the library's wide-ranging and out and ongoing services and programs. I'm Jenny Lawrence, <coughs> former trustee and a longtime member of the library, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Erica Wagner this evening. Erica grew up on the Upper West Side and went to Greeley. She moved to England in the 1980s to continue her education, first at St. Paul's Girls' School and then Cambridge, and finally the University of East Anglia. She lives in London with her husband and son. She was the literary editor of the London Times for 17 years, and now she is a contributing writer for the New Statesman and consulting literary editor for Harper's Bazaar. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, The Economist, The FT, and The New York Times, among others. She's the author of several previous books, including a collection of short stories and a novel. Erica won the Eccles British Library Writers Award in 2014, which I hope she explains uh, sometime this evening. And she is a lecturer in creative writing at Goldsmith, University of London. Her new book is about Washington Roebling, the engineer who constructed the Brooklyn Bridge, and with whom she has been fascinated since she was a girl. At 19, she Xeroxed a small photograph of Civil War Private Washington Rowling that she still carries in her wallet. And over the years, she has relentlessly tracked down new information about it. Hamilton Schuyler in 1931 and David McCullough in 1972 wrote biographies of Rowling and his great work, The Brooklyn Bridge. This was before Washington Rowling's manuscript biography of his father was discovered in the Roblin archives at Rutgers in the 1980s. Erica has found additional letters and his little pocket notebooks, weaving this wealth of new information into an unforgettable portrait, a man born in 1836 who suffered shocking abuse from his father, spoke only German as a child, underwent a Dickensian education, survived the horrors of the Civil War, and overcame the massive challenges of building the Brooklyn Bridge. Afterwards, he ran the Wire Rope Company that his father started in 1841. Its products helped make possible some of the most important technological achievements of the industrial age, whether suspension bridges, telegraph and telephone cables, elevator and aircraft control cables, and countless other applications that wouldn't exist without them. Washington Roebling has lived, had lived several lives by the time he was 32 and began work on the Brooklyn Bridge, and he would live several more before he died at 89. Please join me in welcoming Erica Wagner. Sarah and Katie and everyone here at the library, um, what Jenny did not mention um, was that if I have a literary career at all, it is thanks to this library, because my mother was a passionate member of this place. We lived on the Upper West Side, but we would take the 79th Street Crosstown uh, over here. And before I could read, when I was three or something, insisted on having a book from this library. I just wanted to hold mm. this book. Um, so all those things about myself um, that uh, Jenny read would sound very strange to me when I hear them, but it is <laughs> all thanks to this place. So it's really especially wonderful to be back here. I have not been back since I was about 15. <laughs> 
talk to Jenny about Washington Roman. She gave you a little idea of his life, but I'm going to give you a little bit more. Here is the picture that she mentioned. The picture of Washington Roman, the man who built the Brooklyn Bridge, as it says on the cover of my book. But not just any picture. This is the picture which I've carried in my wallet since I was 19 years old. My bag is behind me here. I wouldn't leave it in the cloakroom because I must never be without this picture. <laughs> it was taken in 1861 when Washington, at the age of 24, had just joined the Union Army. When I was still a teenager, I photocopied it from a book in the New York Public Library. I covered it with sticky tape to protect it, and I made that little envelope to keep it even safer. W-A-R. Wash's middle name was Augustus, and as it happens, my full name is Erica Augusta Wagner. Make of that what you will. <laughs> A strange story, perhaps, so I will elaborate somewhat. I grew up here in Manhattan, as I said, just across the park on the Upper West Side, but I never set foot on the Brooklyn Bridge until I was a teenager. Brooklyn, I fear, was a little less cool in the olden days. <laughs> but then I got myself a boyfriend. So many stories begin this way. A young English civil engineer. He came to visit me in New York one winter. But in truth, it wasn't really me he wanted to visit, I think. It was the Brooklyn Bridge. And so we walked on the promenade together. And like so many before me, and so many since, I was struck with wonder by the bridge. And it was no bad thing that I had someone with me who could explain how it actually worked. The boyfriend did what boyfriends tend to do. He disappeared. <laughs> there you go. However, the fascination with the bridge remained. How did it get there? Who made it? I began to read all I could about it, and that is how I met Washington. I read Hamilton Schuyler's early biography of the Roeblings. I read David McCulloch's The Great Bridge. I read letters, technical reports, newspaper articles, and finally, the gripping and shocking biography he wrote of his father, John A. Roebling. I heard Washington's voice as clear as a bell inside my head, erasing the near century that separated us. I am, and always have been, a writer. I have never been an engineer. <laughs> Washington Roebling spoke to me as one writer to another, and it seemed to me that he wanted me to speak for him. Here's Washington in 1864, not long before he left the Army, after four years hard fighting in the American Civil War, one of the most dreadful conflicts the world has ever seen. But that war was only one of the many challenges this extraordinary man <coughs> would face, a man who was born in 1837 on the frontier and who died in 1926 in the Jazz Age, a life that spanned an American century, a man who made an American icon, a bridge that has not only served New York's commuters and tourists and lovers for nearly a century and a half, but has inspired poets and painters and photographers from Hart Crane to Georgia O'Keeffe to Walker Evans. That beautiful photograph is actually by a photographer called Irving Underhill. It was taken in 1925, the year before Washington died. It's in the archives at Rensselaer, and he's written on the back, keep this for my album. But who was this man? Why do I care about him so much? I want to show you. I want you to care, too. So I need you to know what an unprecedented feat of engineering the Brooklyn Bridge was. The first suspension bridge with cables made of steel. A bridge with a span that would not be significantly surpassed for 50 years, not till the construction of the George Washington Bridge. And a bridge built using a dangerous new technology, 
one that Washington pioneered at great cost to himself. He had taken over the project after the death of his father, John Roebling, a famous engineer who had bridged Niagara Falls and the Ohio River in Cincinnati. At the time, many people thought that to bridge the East River was impossible. But if anyone should be the man to accomplish that feat, well, John Roebling was that man. And then one day, in the summer of 1869, before any real work had been started, before very many plans had been made, John Roebling had what seemed to be a minor accident down by the river. Before two weeks had passed, however, he was dead, a horrible death from tetanus, and it was left to his son to take over the work. Washington had built bridges for the army during the war. He had then supervised the work on his father's Ohio Bridge, yet for all his expertise, he had been his father's lieutenant. But now John Roebling was no more. Here's the Brooklyn Tower of the Brooklyn Bridge under construction in 1872. The bridge's towers are set on foundations deep beneath the East River, foundations sunk using caissons, great chambers set on the river's bed. Inside these chambers, hundreds of men dug out sand and stone, while blocks of granite and limestone built the great tower above. A caisson is launched like a ship from a dock, an upside down ship. This is the Brooklyn caisson before launching on March the 19th, 1870. Here, is Washington's drawing of the inside of the caisson, settled on the riverbed, showing how it works. You can see the men digging down towards bedrock. There are shafts which pump compressed air into the chamber and allow the waste material to be taken out. The roof is made of layer upon layer of dense pitch pine. What's it like to work in compressed air? It's like diving under the ocean. The compressed air of the caisson keeps the river out, but come up too fast from this atmosphere and you get very sick indeed. In the 21st century, this is called decompression sickness. But in the 19th century, when, thanks to projects such as the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, its symptoms began to appear, it was called caisson disease. Getting the bends, some people say. Nitrogen bubbles in the blood cause agonizing pain, paralysis, and sometimes death. But that was only one of the dangers faced in this great work. The roof of the caisson, remember, was made of wood. And one day, in 1870, deep underwater, the wooden roof of the caisson caught fire. <laughs> in the Roebling archives at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Washington's alma mater, is a remarkable document. It is a note, written first in pencil, then crossed out and rewritten in ink, in a hand that is still almost completely legible, despite the passage of time, despite the haste in which it was composed. Accidents is the heading, and it begins with one word, fire. Throughout his life, Washington Roebling would write on any available scrap of paper, on the back of old stationery, on old bills and random slips. Here is one, evidence both of attention and exhaustion, of the need to keep every detail in his mind. It reads now almost like a kind of urgent poetry. Several small fires, leaks in seams, a caulking of oakum catches easily, some easily put out had to flood caisson, danger of doing it. Increased caution, water pipes, hose, steam hose from outside, fire on night of December 1st, candle, pointing with cement, bad place, would not be seen, burnt appearance, living coals, no smoke, risks, ultimate decision, 
1,350,000 gallons of water. Fire not out till roof reached. On the timber roof of the caisson, the tower would rest. If the towers were to fail, all would fail. Everything could have been lost thanks to a moment's carelessness. Washington carefully considered what had caused the blaze. The immediate cause of the fire must be owing to a candle held in the right hand of the man who had his coat or dinner in a candle box which was nailed up over the door close to the roof, he surmised. He could only reach the box by stepping up on a frame brace. When he would hold a candle with his right hand and reach into the box with his left. He must have held the candle there at least a minute, Washington wrote. The man, the Brooklyn Eagle reported, was called McDonald. Once he had seen the hole burn through the wood, he filled it with plaster to conceal the blunder. McDonald soon after disappeared and has not been seen since. But in the oxygen-rich atmosphere of the caisson, the wood behind the patch job kept burning. Living coals, as Washington described them. Buckets of water, carbon dioxide from fire extinguishers had no effect. A desperate remedy had to be tried. There was nothing for it but to flood the caisson from above. But such a plan was more than just risky. If the air should all be out, before the water had reached the roof. The result would be a sudden drop of the caisson and the destruction of all supports by the weight of 28,000 tons, besides running the risk of causing the caisson to leak so badly as to render its reinflation impossible, Washington wrote. He had never been a man to stay at his desk. The chief engineer was now 33 years old. He was down at the work site, down in the caisson as much or more as anyone who worked for him. But now the hard work, and more crucially, the weight of responsibility, began to take its toll on Washington. He had a team of assistants under him, but a decision such as this was his alone. All these considerations had to be carefully weighed, and the risks looked at from both sides before giving the order to flood the caisson. There was no intelligent mind to consult with, as all of my assistants make it a point to live three miles away from this work so as not to be on hand in case of an emergency, he wrote, <laughs> with not a little bitterness. In the meantime, I had been down in the caisson for seven hours and began to experience that peculiar numb feeling in the small of the back and lower limbs which precedes paralysis. Fireboats were called. One million. 350,000 gallons of water were poured down through the caisson shafts, and the caisson remained flooded for two and a half days. It settled by only two inches. When the water was eventually pumped out, the damage had to be painstakingly repaired work of months. Eleven courses of timber had been damaged, more pine was forced into the breaches, and iron straps were bolted to the chamber's roof. After those seven hours down in the caisson, Washington had to be taken home and rubbed for an hour on the spine with salt <coughs> and whiskey. He had tried to rest, but at any moment expected to hear the doorbell ring with a message that the caisson was burning yet. He recovered enough, clearly, to write up his notes. Whether it was the salt and whiskey which did the trick or simply being away from the caisson, we don't know. We don't know if his wife, Emily, tended to him, or how much she would have seen of his three-year-old son. What we can know is that nothing stopped him from his task. Every day brought new challenges and new uncertainties. Washington Ropley might call all this simply doing his job. But considering the strength of mind and feeling required to do that job is what draws us back into a room in a house in Brooklyn Heights, a room scented with smoke and whiskey, to find Washington back at his desk. There were still no end of solutions to be found. The construction of the Brooklyn Bridge took 14 years, 
During those, Washington's health continued to worsen. The manner in which Emily Roebling came to the aid of her husband in the time of his illness is an astonishing story in itself. Emily's role in the building of the Brooklyn Bridge was a crucial one. Washington Roebling and Emily Warren met at a ball in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War in 1864 and were married soon after. That photograph was taken around the time of their wedding. She would have expected, perhaps, the conventional married life of a woman of her time, but that's not what she got. The paralysis from which Washington suffered at the end of 1870 got worse and worse. By 1875, he was hardly able to leave his bed, and he could not tolerate any company except that of his wife. And so she herself became a bridge between the chief engineer and the world, his assistants, the trustees of the bridge. As Washington himself wrote to the New York Times in 1912, a few years after the work was actually commenced, I was stricken with a severe illness. And my own wife, the late Emily Warren Roebling, who died in 1903, became of the greatest assistance to me in my conduct of the routine matters of the work. An eye trouble, long ago healed, prevented me from doing much reading or writing, so that her services as a manuensis became invaluable to me. And this led to other duties in the way of interviewing people, avoiding personal friction by her tact, smoothing over difficulties which were naturally inherent in a work somewhat political in its conduct. The responsible body in charge of the work consisted of a board of trustees, 10 from each city, whose persons usually changed with each change in politics, each new man being, of course, saturated with suspicion of the old management. Here again, her remarkable talent as a peacemaker came into play, and her thorough knowledge of the work and the plans carried conviction to the heart of each new member. Being assisted in these ways for 14 long years with the various phases of the work, she earned a well-deserved recognition as well as my everlasting gratitude. She is often called the first woman field engineer. It is often said that she took over the building of the bridge entirely. Neither of these claims stands up to my mind, but that does not diminish her role. It is quite right that there is a plaque to her there on the bridge. She went on to become one of the first women to graduate with a law degree from NYU. That beautiful portrait is in the Brooklyn Museum. When the bridge finally opened in May 1883, there was a celebration such as the cities of New York and Brooklyn had never seen and perhaps have never seen to this day. But this remarkable story is only part of Washington Roebling's remarkable life. In order to trace that life, I spent hours in the archives of RPI and Rutgers University. I leafed through Washington's college notes. Believe me, you could be glad you didn't go to college in the 1850s. <laughs> I read his love letters. I read his words in praise of his beloved old dog, Billy Sunday. I traveled to the pretty little town of Saxonburg in western Pennsylvania, where Washington grew up, and which remains astonishingly, pretty much as it was when John Roebling built it in the 1830s. I walked across the Ohio River and on the battlefield at Gettysburg. I went to Cold Spring Cemetery, where Washington and Emily are buried. On her gravestone, he had three words inscribed, gifted, noble, true. It has been a wonderful journey. I have built my own bridge, I hope, from the past to the present day. Washington has been my companion for three decades because I am inspired by his tenacity and by the strength of his spirit. If a problem was put in front of him, he would not rest until it was solved. His life was, in many ways, a privileged one. But it was also one marked by brutality and scarred by wars of more than one kind. Nevertheless, 
he persisted. <laughs> Always. When I have felt discouraged, he has given me courage. When I want to give up, he helps me to go on. I know that nothing can be done perfectly at the first trial, he once wrote. I also know that each day brings its little quota of experiences, which, with honest intentions, will lead to perfection after a while. Thank you. Schuyler or the McCullough book. John um, Rowling is portrayed as a 
He's a fine, upstanding man. He's portrayed as pretty stern. Uh -huh. I mean, I think it would be hard to meet him. Um, you know, I think the modern measure of someone is always whether you want to go have a beer with someone, isn't it? <laughs> um, it would be hard to want to have a beer with old John Lovling, I think. He was a very uh, kind of stern old Prussian people thought of him as. Um, but what was really going on in the family home was not known. Washington wrote this memoir. Um, some people saw it. Uh, people knew that he was writing it. His son, who was also called John, knew that he was writing it, but after his death, at some point, it seemed to vanish. Sometimes these things happen. And then, kind of mysteriously, in the 1980s, it was turned up in the Rutgers archive. Things get misfiled. It was there all along. By uh, a man, a friend of mine called Don Sayenga, who was the first uh, person to work with it and who was a, an important uh, source for me. So you were thinking of writing a biography at that time? Well, as I had been thinking of writing a biography since I was 18 years old. And one of the reasons that I forgive myself for taking so long to get around to it is if I had written it sort of much earlier, I would not have had this remarkable source either. So proof that things happen when they must. That's what I tell myself. Anyway, but it really is true in this case. Um, it's, an, it's a really startling and, and vivid account, but it's also a vivid account of many other things, not least Washington's extraordinary service uh, during the American Civil War. Um, so, how did Washington feel about taking over from his father? <laughs> when, I guess he was his he assistant had to do for it. a while. He had to do it. Um, he was nothing if not the man who did his duty. There really was no one else in the country who would have been equipped to, to do this job. It's hard to realize now when the Brooklyn Bridge is such an established fixture, not just of our lives here in New York, but around the world it looks like it's always been there. And bigger, bolder suspension bridges are built all the time. Every stage of construction of the Brooklyn Bridge was radical. It's absolutely true what I said, that plenty of people thought, people who should have known that a bridge this size could never have been built. Prior to this, all bridges were made using iron. Steel was a brand new and pretty unreliable, it was thought, metal produced in that quantity. So Washington had to figure out as he was going, and again, this doesn't really happen now, um, but he knew he was the only one he knew. He did, but he knew he would have to figure it out. Yeah. It was not all, some people thought, and people still said, that um, people still say that it's almost as if the bridge was a kind of giant erector set. You know, he had all the plans and he just had to put it together. But it was absolutely not like that. So he felt he had no choice but to do it. You know, I think there was a point in his life where he thought that he might actually escape his father's influence, his father's grasp. Kind of ironically, his father's death ensured that he would not <laughs> do so. I, you mentioned his father's interest in water cures, which really was his nemesis. Indeed. Um, you could talk a little bit about that. John Roebling made Gwyneth Paltrow look like someone with an advanced medical degree. <laughs> Is the way that I would put it. In a, in a time of enormous kind of crankery and quackery around medicine, John Roebling beat them all. <laughs> Part of the reason that he died was because he would not see a doctor and he would not have any medical treatment ever except for the treatment that he himself devised. What he believed in was the water cure. Now, plenty of people believed in this at the time. You can still go to spas in places like 
Wiesbaden in Germany and Bath in England. Uh, Charles Darwin took his daughter when she was sick, um, I believe, to Bath. So this was quite common at the time, but John Rodling really took it to the extreme, and also he was prey for a man presumably of science to any kind of snake oil salesman <laughs> who crossed his path. And these people, he would inflict them then on his family. He would bring them uh, to live with the family. All the food in the house would be thrown out, and everyone would have to live on rotten figs and graham flour uh, <laughs> until this fad passed. Um, it was a really kind of you know, strange um, upbringing. But, but basically, John Roebling didn't trust anyone's opinion but his own, which was one of the things that made him such a tough dad. The, I was, just before we go on to the Civil War, I was just interested in uh, Washington's uh, learning, going to school at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And I guess that was the first engineering? Yes, that was, I mean, it was the first um, uh, technical college in the United States. Uh, it's still going strong. I was just there the other day. Uh, I gave a talk there, which was a wonderful thing to do, although Washington himself had pretty mixed feelings about the place. To give an idea of the severity of the regime, he was a member of the class of 1857. There were about 47 people in his class when he started, and I, 10 or 12 of them managed to graduate. Mm -hmm. It was really, really tough. And um, as I think you mentioned, because Washington was raised in a completely German community, he didn't even speak English until he was about 12 and was sent away to school. Um, and at the time, also, too, to have an education in engineering was not necessarily what you had to have. Uh, in order to be a civil engineer. Civil engineering was quite new, and plenty of the people who worked with Washington, some of his most valued assistants on the bridge, never went to college at all, just gained their knowledge in the saddle, as it were. But he was for three years at Rensselaer. He found it very difficult, but he remained attached to the place. His, many of his papers were there. He sent his own son there, um, and he would always complain when all of his life they asked him for money. Um, <laughs> nothing ever changes. Um, but he always gave it to them. But do you think uh, what the balance of his experience as an engineer came from his father and, and what came from the Rensselaer? Um, he, said, he said that uh, what he learned at Rensselaer was of limited use. Mm -hmm because a huge amount of it was rote memorization. At Rensselaer, you can see his notebooks. You had to go to lectures and take notes um, day after day after day. They never had any breaks. This was six days a week. His father wouldn't give him any money to live on, really, so he was always cold and always hungry. But he said, um, and it was in every conceivable subject as well, not just engineering, but anything that could be considered technical or scientific. He said later in his life that he remarked that if a horse or a dog could be taught to remember, surely sheer memory was not such a valuable technique. He said he had to spend years and years forgetting almost all of the stuff that he learned at Rensselaer in order to do his work. But that was education then. So after the, after the Rensselaer, 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 he was assistant to his father on the... Yes, he worked, he worked with his father and then, um, and then he went to war. Then in 1861, he went to war. Part of what he did during the war was building bridges. But then also after the war, he uh, really had almost complete control of this beautiful bridge, which still stands. If you've ever been to the fine city of Cincinnati, Ohio, you will see the John A. Roebling Bridge between Cincinnati and Covington, Kentucky. Uh, 
Um, and it, that bridge was absolutely designed by John Roebling, but it was Washington who supervised all of the work. Uh, in your account of Washington Roebling in the Civil War, his, it almost seemed liberating <laughs> for him. Yes. And however bloody and disastrous it was, he was not under his fault. He was his own man. I think that's very, uh, that's a very perceptive thing to, to and say. And his letters are, to his brother and his sister, are simply extraordinary. Yes, all so of his, all of his. tell us about that. Yeah, he, um, uh, so the Civil War, um, as I'm sure all of you know, um, was pretty much the most awful war that's ever been fought. I think it could be fair to say. Um, 750,000 people died, approximately, during the course of the American Civil War, if an equivalent proportion of the American population were to die in a war today, that would mean 7 million people, mm -hmm. which is pretty unimaginable, I think. Incredibly, Washington was at so many of the significant battles of this war. He rose from private to colonel, which was quite unusual. He was at Second Bull Run, he was at Chancellorsville, he was at Antietam, he was at Gettysburg, he was at Petersburg. He was never injured, which is really quite extraordinary. He had the devil's own luck. But yes, he was his own man. When the war was not terribly frightening and brutal, like most wars, it was boring, and what there was to do was write letters. So his correspondence to his brothers, to his father, to a man called Charles Swan, who was his great friend, his father's associate, and then eventually to his fiancée, Emily, who he met in 1864, are the most extraordinary, vivid record of his service. I, I was interested uh, in his account of his, <coughs> his superiors. He was very critical of them, and it was that in itself was shocking. Yes. He was. But uh, also, he wrote a portrait of Lincoln before the Battle of the Wilderness. And it's just, his writing is just incredible. And I thought I'd just read it. Please do. Uh, in 1864, the president traveled down to Culpeper County to review the army before the Battle of the Wilderness. In an account written in a letter decades later, he described Lincoln's participation in the cavalcade. Quote, the president was mounted on a hard-mouthed, fractious horse and was evidently not a skilled horseman. Soon after the march began, his stovepipe hat fell off. Next, his pantaloons, which were not fastened on the bottom, slipped up to his knees, showing his white homemade drawers, secured below with some strings of white tape, which presently unraveled and slipped up also, revealing a long, hairy leg. <laughs> While we were inclined to smile, we were at the same time very much chagrined to see our poor president compelled to endure such unmerited and humiliating torture. After repairs were made, the review continued, but was shortened on his account. I never saw him again and was in Covington, Kentucky, when I heard of his assassination. Um, one of the most uh, extraordinary things I found in my researches, one of the marvelous things about doing research in an archive is you just never know what you will find. Um, John Roebling had a craze in the late 1850s and early 1860s. He decided that he would be a farmer in Iowa. He bought a lot of land in Iowa territory as it was then. And he bought it from former soldiers. Former soldiers were allowed to buy land at a cheap, especially cheap price. But if they wanted to sell it on again to someone like John Roebling, they had to have the sale authorized by the President of the United States. So I was looking through folders that I thought would be pretty boring and not really of relevance to me, but you have to look at stuff. And Iowa land territories, <coughs> Iowa land sales, say these folders. The last parcel of land that John Rowling bought was in August of 1861. So I pull out the certificate, 
which has been signed by Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And it really was an extraordinary moment. And also to think that the war began in April. So the war is going on, and he still has to sign these things, <laughs> which are like for 100 acres, 125 acres. They must have been piling up on his desk, no matter what else was going on. This, I mentioned it in my book, it's a, it's a footnote. But it really was a very uh, striking moment. Uh, and so after, or just as this last year of the Civil War, he met Emily Warren. And it was a whirlwind romance. It was. It was, uh, he was smitten instantly. She was the very much younger sister of his commanding officer, a very interesting person called General G.K. Warren. She grew up in uh, Cold Spring. He had been at West Point, Warren. Um, and she was 13 years younger than her brother. And one of the significant things about her brother, who had a lot of responsibility for her care, is that he made sure to pay for her education. She had a very good education. And this was not necessarily by any means usual at the time. They met at a ball. He had been up to this point, we can gather, not especially interested in girls. He was thinking about other stuff, at least according to his mother. Um, but he was smitten right away. He wrote to his favorite sister, his younger sister, Elvira, I believe she has captured your brother Washi's heart at last. <laughs> and they were married um, in January of 1865, shortly after uh, she was discharged. Um, and as I say, she was really a remarkable woman in her own right and had, I think, probably not the kind of life that she would have expected when they married. And John Roebling approved of her? Yes, John Roebling approved, much to Washington's surprise. He wrote to his father with fear and trembling saying that he'd met this girl. And John's letter to his son, I mean, I can see why Washington was startled, because it is a letter of warmth and trust, such as you really do not see anywhere else in John Roebling's correspondence. It caused Washington to consider, to muse to Emily, that perhaps his father had had experiences of love of which he did not know. Washington's Poor mother, as I have indicated, had a pretty rough time. Um, but yes, his father loved Emily and was very approving and supportive of their marriage. And so the, the young couple moved to Cincinnati. Cincinnati. They moved to Cincinnati. And again, John Roebling, he did not think that engineers' wives should live with engineers. Um, but that in, in that, at least, Washington determined to, um, to forge his own path. So Emily was always and, and then they went abroad. Yes, and then, nine months. and then they had this remarkable trip to Europe. Uh, when John Roebling knew that the Brooklyn Bridge was in the offing, he sent Washington and Emily, who was pregnant, off on an extraordinary trip to Europe, to Britain, and to France, and to Germany, and what is now Czechoslovakia, to look at the most sophisticated techniques for the building of suspension bridges. All of those techniques were really being developed in Europe at the time, particularly the use of caissons, the foundations that I mentioned. Those were really developed um, in Europe. And also, he went uh, to Britain particularly to look at uh, wire manufacturers, because in fact, although John Roebling was a manufacturer of wire, the wire for the Cincinnati uh, suspension bridge came from England, from a firm called Richard Johnson and Nephew. Um, and the letters, again, from this trip are so remarkable because it's clear that Washington could spend all day looking around a factory or a site with someone and then come back to his hotel and he would write a 12-page letter, a 17-page letter, a 27-page letter, describing exactly what he had seen in every respect. It's really amazing. So it's, it's clear that John Roebling valued this sum very much.
And so now we get to the Brooklyn Bridge. Indeed. Um, and that was the end of John Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Tetanus, um, tetanus is a terrible way to die. Of course, it's preventable now. You just get an injection. But it's still a bad problem um, in countries where they don't have access. But he tried to, to cure this. himself with water. Indeed, he tried to cure himself, needless to say, with water. Um, Washington called a doctor, tried to call a doctor, but the doctor was sent away. He poured water on his foot, mm. and that didn't work. Mm. And he died on the morning of July the 22nd, 1880. 69, and then it was left to Washington to build the bridge. I thought what was, I just some facts about Britain, I mean Brooklyn, sorry, that it took its name from Brooklyn, a township in the province of Utrecht founded in 1636. And in 1869, Brooklyn was the third largest city in the US. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yes. And it's by 1870, 70 million crossings of the East River every year. Which is an extraordinary figure, I think. I found that uh, figure in the New York Times, that 70 million ferry crossings were made every year. I mean, ferry crossings, crossings of the East River Ferry. So they needed a bridge. So they needed a bridge. <laughs> um, it does seem my, uh, my editor queried that enormous figure, but I don't know, if it's in the New York Times, it must be true. Right? <laughs> begins to cover it. So dealing with the men who were the trustees, first of the bridge company, the bridge started off being built by a private company, but then devolved onto the two cities, New York and Brooklyn. Again, I'm sure you'll know, were two separate cities up until 1898. Um, and so a huge part of the difficulty was dealing with the men who were in charge of the money really. And in 1882, there was a move to get Washington kicked off uh, as chief engineer. Uh, that was a, a moment of high drama, but they did not succeed. And he remained chief engineer to the very end, but did not, because of his illness, as far as we know, did not cross the finished bridge until quite some time later. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seemed as though he must have gotten better from the vents. Do you get better after years and years of suffering from the <clears throat> You can get better. The nature of his illness is somewhat mysterious. And I think you have to be careful about retrospective diagnosis, mm -hmm. always. He was clearly affected by his childhood, too. He was clearly affected by the war. He was clearly affected by the stress and the strain, and when he was away from that somewhat, he did get better, but never, never completely. Again, one of the things that was fascinating to discover, he called himself an, an invalid all his life, although he outlived both of his younger brothers and his nephews. Um, but one thing that decompression sickness can do that has only been discovered quite recently is it can destroy the tiny, tiny little blood vessels that you have in your bones. This is something called dysbaric osteonecrosis. Mm -hmm. And because blood can never flow again as it needs to, even in your bones, you can suffer terrible, debilitating pain, even when other aspects of decompression sickness have been relieved. He did always complain about pains in his jaw and various kinds of aches, and so it is absolutely possible that this was something that, that affected him all his, all his life. But Emily always took his complaints about his health with a grain of salt, and that is one of the most entertaining aspects of reading some of her letters 
where she writes to their son, pleasingly, they were quite a close family, oh, your father was saying again he would be dead by morning, and then he felt fine when he woke up. Um, so again, how much of this was physical and how much was psychological? You, you, can't, ever, you can't ever know. Well, I think we should uh, see if anyone else has some questions and uh, bring it to a close. Yes. Where was the mother at all? Uh, Washington's mother. Yes. Poor Washington's mother. Um, she stayed in Saxonburg. She died. I am 49 now. Um, and she had been dead for three years by the time she was my age, having had nine children, um, seven of whom lived. Uh, she had a very hard life indeed. She never learned to speak English. As I said, Washington did not. Uh, John Roebling, rather, did not believe that uh, engineers' wives should travel with them. So she lived a really hard domestic life. What impact on the son, though, I'm curious. Oh, he adored his mother. I mean... She must have had a very strong She did, and he, he said that. Um, he's, she clearly was one of the great ameliorating influences on his life. And it's telling, again, one can't be sure, but Washington's youngest brother, was called Edmund. And he is someone who went completely off the rails. It's a very sad story. Edmund, however, was very, very young when Johanna Roebling died. And it's hard not to think, not to imagine what it must have been like only to have John Roebling as a parent. He loved his mother very much. And that um, there's one picture of her, that handsome face. He looks quite like his mother. Yes. Was he involved with any other bridges after the Brooklyn Bridge? No. Not, re not really. He had, he, no, he had no interest, or because oh, he had he had interest, but he was not well. Um, the family company, John A. Roebling Sons Company, was very much involved in other bridges. Um, so there are uh, Roebling cables in the Williamsburg Bridge, and then after. Uh, Washington's death in the uh, George Washington Bridge and in the Golden Gate Bridge. So he remained involved in the company and certainly took an interest, but he was not, um, uh, he was never in charge of another bridge. Yes. Yes, so we always are. Now, Lisa, you spoke at great length about the um, engineering artistry, but you didn't address the aesthetic artistry of the bridge. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? That's a, that's a good question. The, the bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge as you see it, is John Roebling's design. The design of the towers and the cables. Um, if you go to uh, the archives at Rensselaer, there are these extraordinary, some of the most extraordinary drawings are the tower elevations drawn by John Roebling, which are about eight feet long, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. feet. He lay them out on the table and they're incredible. Um, he had a great aesthetic sense. And he absolutely believed, as, as many people did though, it's one of the wonderful things about reading about the 18th and 19th centuries, that the aesthetic and the technical were not separated in the way that they can be now. I would also argue that it's one of the wonderful things about any kind of engineering, any structure that does what it is meant to do and is designed simply to fulfill these, its structural needs will perforce be beautiful. Beauty is inherent. The way that a suspension bridge must be built ensures that it is beautiful. I have no great love, let's say, of the three bridges across the river. I don't especially uh, love the Williamsburg Bridge, but still, it has the loveliness of that curve, of its support. So part of it um, is simply the structural necessity. John Rowling, though, also was ahead of his time. I'm sure you all know that um, we have in New York three new bridges finished or about to be finished, the Kosciuszko Bridge, the New New York Bridge, the Tappan Zee Bridge, and the Gophels 
crossing, and all of those are called cable stay bridges, which is theoretically a relatively new method of building bridges. It's cheaper than building suspension bridges. But those diagonal cable stays, which you can see in the New York Bridge, are the diagonal stays which you see in the Brooklyn Bridge. So the Brooklyn Bridge is actually a combination suspension and cable stay bridge. That's what, that's what that beautiful lattice work is. So that was really something um, ahead of its time. Thank you. Well, on that note, I think uh, we will thank Erica. <laughs>